and some you'll get right away. So there is practice involved, and there's tools that you develop. And that's why we're doing these examples. Let's check this now. So Seth had a good um, objection. He said, well, we're not accepting single zeros, and we're not accepting empty strings. Well, now we kind of are, right? We certainly accept the empty string. Do we accept a single zero? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 because we're missing an error. Right, well, that's another thing. We never finished this machine, right? I said it's finished every zeros and ones out of every error. I lied, right? There's no zero out of here. Zero, goes back. zero should go back to itself. If the last two symbols were zero and you get another zero, then the last two symbols are still zero. So now we've got that nice accepting single zeros. We accept the empty string, and we accept anything that ends in two zeros. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a process here and a discovery, and it took a little more time. Let me give you a faster way that we might have done this if you had known something in advance. Let's say you knew that if you could accept a particular language, that you knew a way to accept its reverse. Okay. Let's say any time you knew a language and how to do it and how to make a machine for it, and I told you, do it for the reverse of that language. What does the reverse of the language mean? It means every string in the language just gets reversed. So what's the reverse of things that are divisible by four? Two zeros. Things that start with two zeros. What if you always knew, given a machine for one set, how to get the machine for the reverse? What if there was a process, an easy process? Then you'd think about this, you'd say, gee, ending with two zeros, that's like the one we did in class. And it wasn't quite so easy. So, but I know a really easy way to do things that start with two zeros. I'll just do that, and then I'll figure out the way to reverse it. Right, so there is a way to do that. And there's a way to do lots and lots of these, what are called closure operations. There's a way to do reverse. There's a way to do many, many things like it. There's a way to do complement. And these closure ideas are a key thing that people think about when they talk about models of computation. Not just because it's interesting mathematically, but because it gives you a whole repertoire of tools to decide whether or not a set can be accepted by a finite state machine and how to do it. Knowing the reverse here would have helped us. We did it anyway because we're smart. But you never know when that's going to fail you. OK. What if I asked you for all the binary numbers that aren't divisible by 4? Do we start from scratch? <coughs> yeah, what if I just take this final state, good idea, Sean, make it a non-final state, and take these two, sta two non-final states and make them final states. I just toggle all the final and non-final states. Whatever used to not be accepted, I now accept. And whatever used to be accepted, I now don't accept. And that actually is a good enough proof that finite state machines are closed under complement. That means if you can do one kind of set, you can do its complement. Just toggle the final and non-final states. Right? So that's the first closure proof we've actually done. It's, it's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of other ones that we'll get to later. All right, any more questions about this? One, one, zero, one, one, zero. I mentioned that one of the big applications of finite state machines are building string searching uh, uh, tools in editors. So, well, here it is. Here is a string we want to search for. Build me the finite state machine that accepts any string that contains this. And then you could actually implement that as a program. And, and, and that's a, there's actually not obvious ways to do it. There's a lot of uh, good and bad ways to do it. There's a whole area in algorithms called string matching. And it's based on finite state machines, and it's clever ways of implementing finite state machines in order to search for strings. And the first one of those was due to Knuth, Morris, and Pratt. And I think we even did a recitation on it back in uh, a few months ago. But now let's just write a finite state machine straight. Who's got an idea? Where do we begin here? Mm -hmm. Chris, you have a series of states representing progress along that line as we're matching. OK, we're going to have a series of states that represent how much of this string we've seen. And if we actually see the whole string, then at the end, we'll put a, a double circle. So let's, let's do that. We start here. I've seen a 1. That's good. I've seen another 1. That's good. I've seen a 0. Very fine. A 1, a 1, a 0. And I accept here. And I'll put little uh, semantic notes in my states. Here I've seen nothing. The book uses an epsilon or an e to represent the empty string. Some books use a lambda to represent the empty string. Different books use different things. And I will try to use an e, but sometimes I may forget and use a lambda. It just means no string at all, just the, empty, the null, the zero ASCII value. 
Um, this says I've seen a 1. This says I've seen two 1s. I've seen 1, 1, 0. I've seen 1, 1, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And here I've seen everything. All right, so now we just got to fill in the rest. And how easy or hard is this? Well, let's try and see. Say I'm here and I get a 0. Then how much of this string have I seen? None of it. Say I'm here and I get a 0. Then I've seen a 1, 0. That means I've seen none of the string. Back to here. Here I've seen 1, 1. And if I see a 0, I go here. What if I get another 1? Because I've still seen two 1s. Right? You can all see that this is a little bit, you've got to use your head when you're doing this. There's actually a complete mechanical process to build this machine. And that's what the knuth morris pratt algorithm is all about. It's how to build up an array that represents this machine in linear time without having to do too much thinking. We're kind of doing it by thinking. Well, we do everything by thinking. Yes. Maybe not everything. Now what? A zero there. One, one, zero, then we get another zero. We haven't seen any of the string then. Back to here. One, one, zero, one, if we get a zero. I think we're back to the start again. Most of the. No, no. We get to go to. No, I don't think so. If we get a zero here, I don't think we've seen any of the string. Yeah. It's the next one. Now, what about here? One, one, zero, one, one, one. Then how much of the string have we seen? One, one, zero, one, one, one. We've seen two ones. OK? This is tricky. One, one, zero, one, one, one. How much of this pattern can we pull out of here from the right end? That's as much as we can. If we go back one more symbol, we have one, 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 and, and, and that doesn't match. So what you're really asking is, how much of this pattern can overlap with the right side? And you can, you can imagine there's probably some mechanical process to do it, and there is, and it's clever. Uh, so this goes back to here on a 1. And finally, here on a 0 or a 1, we've already seen the whole string. It doesn't matter what happens. OK. And of course, if I wanted all the strings that don't contain this as a substring, I just turn that into a non-final state and turn all these into final states. The reason I'm mentioning that is because if I started with that example, it might have taken us longer to discover this idea. The way to do things that don't contain this string is really to do things that do contain the string and just flip all the states. It's very hard to focus on the characteristics of strings that don't contain this explicitly. And it actually ends up being six different kinds of things. We could actually give meanings to each of these. And if you tried to do it that way, you would have spent a lot of time. So doing it this way is a quicker and a faster way. All right. Keep this example in mind, because when we add on an extra arm to this machine, we're going to give it power. We're going to give it power that turns out not to actually help it at all, but just help us write easier machines. When we give it this power, we're going to be able to write this example like that in a flash. And we're going to need a proof that this power can always be converted back to something without the power. That there's always a way to take these fancier machines and write them without the fancy stuff. And this power that we're talking about that we'll get to before the end of the day is called non-determinism. And you heard it before in the algorithms class, but now you're going to get it by a real definition and not just by an algorithm intuition. All right. Ooh, yeah. Well. I, I've got a, the complement for sure, but the complement's different than the reverse. The complement is all the things that are not in the set, and the reverse is take all the strings in the set and reverse them. So that they might be different things. Well, if you just took the complement of each thing in the pattern, you went zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Oh, you mean to reverse? Well, I guess that, I guess strings that contain zero, one, one, zero, one, one is the reverse of, of this. Right, well, so you're asking yourself a good question. If I have a finite state machine, how do I get a finite state machine that accepts the reverse language? We haven't discussed it yet. I said it could be done. 